I got invited to go to YouTube's Edicon last month because uh, we are an education channel. Shh. I got to meet a lot of amazing creators and stay in this beautiful room on the 23rd floor of a seven-star hotel. At the conference, I kind of felt inadequate. There's Roshni, who with exam fear has made over 6,000 videos and helped thousands of kids get through their curriculum. She even received a shout-out from a board exam topper. Then there's Vitamin 3, who makes awesome videos explaining different concepts related to women's health and feminism. Rachna, who cleared the CA exam in her first attempt and now helps others do the same. Taskeen, who makes videos about personal finance and career advice. And Niharika, who teaches people to become excellent communicators. Now, I was a little unique on the panel because those ladies actually knew what they were talking about. When I begin working on a new video topic or a review for a phone, my starting point is much lower. But there are several things I've picked up in the year or so that this channel's been around. Things that I had no idea about when I started out. Lighting, green screen, what processor is the fastest, how megapixel count is and isn't important, and that Realme and Redmi are not the same thing. And all that, along with a general inspiration from Edicon, got me thinking about how we learn. For example, Snapdragon 855 is the most powerful mobile processor available for Android. When did you and I know this? Is this conceptual knowledge or have we just memorized it? How important is the knowledge of the number and the configuration of the course with respect to what I'm trying to convey on this channel? And how does this information organize itself in my brain? Let me try and work it out. Snapdragon's 8 series is its flagship line of processors. I know this because I've reviewed several phones with the 845 and 855 processors. Now 855 plus must be better than 855 because the symbol plus points to a concept called more in my head. At Qualcomm's launch event, they talked about the core configuration, a prime core three performance cores and four efficiency cores. I can just about remember this much from December. And here we hit the limits of my knowledge. I don't really have much more of an idea about this. There are certain facts I could look up, such as the speed of each core, but my brain has so far deemed this knowledge unnecessary for my day-to-day -day requirements. The brain has 80 billion neurons which network with each other forming trillions of connections that help us remember and relate memories, ideas and concepts. By the very act of talking about what I already know, I'm reinforcing these pathways, which in turn may make it easier to absorb more details about the same topic once I encounter more information. Now think of an engineer at Qualcomm who designs these chips. The knowledge I have must be absolutely second nature to her, as deeply ingrained in her mind as the sky is blue. And she must see soaring levels of details that at my current level, I couldn't even comprehend without extensive study. From the Qualcomm engineer, let me segue to Michelangelo Betio. Yes, this long-haired metal god is what's known as a virtuoso. At such heights of technical prowess in his field that even with the utmost dedication, few would ever be able to match him. And this is what his music sounds like. Now far be it for me to criticize something as subjective as someone's music. So I let other people do the dirty work. It is in fact a common criticism of virtuosos. They get so caught up in the technical details of a performance that they ignore what some would say is more essential to art. Emotion, feeling and creativity. Now how many of you have heard the term jack of all trades? Sounds somewhat positive until you get the rest of the phrase. Jack of all trades, master of none. The existence of these two personalities, jack of all trades and the virtuoso points towards the limitations of the human mind. Despite whatever the pseudo-religious books say about using just 5% of its capacity. Yeah, only part of our brain is accessible to conscious thought and for a pretty good reason. We need the brain to work in the background, maintaining the processes that allow us to balance, to breathe and maintain some kind of sanity. It takes time and a lot of repetition for us to build the neural connections that grant us knowledge and skills. Let's quickly exercise that. Repeat after me. Boris Johnson is the Prime Minister of the UK. And now you know something that you may not have known 10 seconds ago. And if you still haven't absorbed it, it's okay. Many of our British friends are struggling to come to terms with it too. But this is just a name. Here's a face to go with it. Human beings are good at remembering faces, you know, because we're social animals. So this is easy. Next, his age. Then his education. His candles. His beliefs his public statements. We quickly begin to run out of capacity and also fucks to give. So the fundamental problem remains. Even for the best trained, most curious individuals, the brain is limited, both in terms of storage and cognition, let alone computation and response time where we were left behind ages ago. A computer, however, can store this information instantaneously. And not just Boris Johnson, every Prime Minister in the history of the UK and every country in the world. But this is one-dimensional, sterile kind of knowledge. It has no depth or life. 
It's not the rich, interconnected knowledge informed by experience and understanding that we have. But with AI, we're trying to change the role of computers in the modern world. As we offloaded physical work to machines during the Industrial Revolution, the Cognitive Revolution aims to upload our mental burdens to digital minds. There is a race, sometimes based on facts, sometimes based on fiction, that is occurring in our world right now. A race that will shape each of our lives, whether we're a part of it or not. Some have said that AI will be mankind's last invention. That an AI program that can improve itself faster than its human creators will eventually be set in motion and grow to become the dominant intelligence of our planet. In Elon Musk's words, humanity would be relegated to being the biological bootloader from which AI creates itself. Regarding us in terms of intellect the same way as we might regard ants. So what can we do? The same person who believes this dark vision of digital intelligence supremacy has also proposed a solution. A hybrid version of the human mind where we interface with machines in order to grow our mind's potential. Allowing us to not only keep up but benefit from the cognitive revolution. Presenting the Neuralink, the path, the only path according to some, for humans to remain the dominant intelligence on Earth. Elon Musk is the crazy billionaire supervillain of our world who is trying to overcome humanity's biological limitations. He was one of the co-inventors of PayPal and has gone on to start companies like Tesla, SpaceX and is behind the exciting but dubious plans for the Hyperloop. His most recent leap into the future is the Neuralink, a brain-machine interface. I won't go too deep into the details, but essentially, it allows to put up to 10,000 electrodes into the brain which will collect signals and feed them into a processor which can decrypt their meaning. According to Elon Musk, this is a thousand times more electrodes than any other FDA-approved process today. But take that with a pinch of salt. He has a history of making tall claims. The threads they're using are thin enough that you can pass them off as hair. So maybe you can sport some cool RGB hairstyles in the future. Of course, no human being is capable of putting 10,000 electrodes into your brain with such precision. And for that, we have this evil looking robot. You really better hope no one pulls your hair once you've gone through this procedure. Or maybe you will wear a protective cap on top and those awesome powdered wigs from the Victorian era will make a comeback. But apparently it's wireless. You've got 10,000 threads, how is it wireless? Anyway, the N1 chip. No prizes for guessing what the N stands for. The N1 chip is the main processing unit which will register the spikes of current coming from your brain and try to figure out what exactly you're trying to do. Best of luck. Sometimes I can't figure that out myself. So what can you use this for? You can use it to communicate. Use a mobile, keyboard or mouse with your mind. You can use it to control a robotic arm or control a mobile chair. Now, the first time someone tries this, they won't get it right. But the assumption is that since the brain is plastic, you'll be able to adapt and figure out how to use the devices over time with a greater and greater degree of control. A lot of this is already possible with a 100 electrode system called the UTA array. But the improved resolution and portability of the Neuralink might make it far more useful. In the beginning, they will target the centers of the brain related to spatial awareness and motor functions since most of the medical uses are related to helping people who are paralyzed. The proposed uses are partly motivated by the good of humanity and for the technology to get funded, become mainstream and a regular part of people's lives. But this statement at 6.02, this is the end game. But I, I think even in a benign AI scenario, we will be left behind. With um, a high bandwidth brain machine interface, I think we can actually go along for the ride. Symbiosis with AI Elon Musk has a very pessimistic view of the future of AI. He believes that, but for some sort of intervention. The era of machine intelligences will dawn and relegate humanity to, at best, onlookers as the world moves on without them. He's also at least aware of something called Roko's Basilisk, a thought experiment dreamed up in 2010 on the Less Wrong Internet Forum. As per the idea, there is a non-zero probability of a runaway digital intelligence coming into existence. And once it does, it will punish those who knew about its possible emergence, yet chose either to do nothing or to actively impede it. This is true even if the intelligence has the betterment of humanity as its primary motive. Because the sooner it comes into existence, the more evil it can prevent. A rational method for a super intelligent entity to ensure its existence, expedite its emergence, and encourage compliance in the future. Remember the basilisk from Harry Potter? If you looked into its eyes, you would die instantly. Well, the user Roko's post was called a basilisk because the knowledge of this is enough to make you a part of this dangerous game. Now that you know about Roko's basilisk, you have a decision to make. 
one that may determine your fate for all of eternity. It would be a trivial problem for a super intelligence to trap your consciousness in code and torture you for centuries. Just saying. But there are several convincing rebuttals to it that I'll post in the description. Though I'd suggest erring on the side of caution. Anyway, Elon Musk thinks that by hooking our minds to computers, we can augment our minds to the point that we co-evolve with AI, always remaining in control. Connecting up to not only the spatial and motor regions of the brain, but also the parts responsible for vision, hearing, learning, pleasure, pain and every possible sense that is available to us in our subjective experience. In the future, all of that could be encoded and stored. Now, if there is enough detail there, do those codes and algorithms become us? Are we anything more than the thoughts, feelings and images that flit across our consciousness? This constant feed of stimulus is who we really are, isn't it? Perhaps we'll not require traditional teaching anymore. We could acquire knowledge as easily as installing a program. That kung fu scene from the matrix could finally become reality. And why should we stop at that? Like we put Instagram filters on our photos, what's to stop us from adding a filter of Chopin's music ability and listen to today's music as he would perceive it? Okay, that's a terrible idea. Think of something else. How about being able to look at ourselves from the viewpoint of a loved one? And why stop at that? Why not change to pure consciousness and live in virtual worlds designed perfectly to our needs, unencumbered from the breakdowns and aches of the physical body? It's a big topic and we'll be talking about this a lot more in the days to come. Consider this a primer. Before I go, I want to tell you guys something. I'm not the most tech savvy person. I'm learning these things as I go and it's exciting to imagine what technology has in store for us and how it might change the civilization in the future. Some of you will know more about these topics than me and some less. Whatever it may be, I hope you'll accompany me on this journey of discovery. In a community of the curious to collectively figure out where we're headed and where we want to go. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Like, share, subscribe and people's elbow that bell icon to get more videos like this in your recommendations. I'll see you really soon. Bye.